So let's begin where we left off um, on, the last, uh, on, the la on, on the first part. See, we were looking at the manifold, two-dimensional manifold, coordinates x and y, and you had like a, cr a closed, simple, piecewise, smooth contour with a positive orientation named C lambda. And throughout this manifold, we have a field V, which is kind of a gradient of some uh, scalar function H. So at each point, throughout your contour, you have a field V with components Vx and Vy. And it, that point can be mapped to an auxiliary space with coordinates Vx and Vy. And so this point here, let's call it point P, is mapped to this point P tilde that has components Vx and Vy. And so V, this field V, works as a map in this context from this point P to this point P tilde in this auxiliary space. And in a similar way, this field V, which is defined, remember, at every point on this, on this manifold here, maps this curve C lambda to an auxiliary curve C lambda tilde in this manifold. It can be something like this. So let's call this C tilde lambda. It's kind of the mapping of this curve into this manifold as a consequence of this vector field. And since this is going to be useful, let's call this, this point, the origin in this space, point O. That has, of course, coordinates 0, 0. So now imagine that you do a circulation in the positive sense along this contour C. When you return to the, to the initial point, the vector is again the same. But if you look at the angle, so if, if you look if you, put, so if you decompose this vector into a vertical and horizontal directions and you look at this angle omega, after you do a contour integration of this angle omega along this contour, this doesn't have to be zero. Can be, will be in general a multiple of two pi. So let's call it two pi omega, where omega is a whole number. It can be positive, negative, but it's not never a fraction, a whole number. So what is the meaning of this omega? It turns out that this omega is a winding number. Winding number. I forgot to put up in time. So um, what is a winding number? The winding number of a curve, let's erase this, winding number of, the cur of a curve C tilde around the point O, so the, the winding number of this curve C tilde around the point O is essentially the number of times that C tilde travels anti-clockwise. So in the positive sense, around the point O. So, Let's, let me just make a couple of drawings to help to illustrate this concept. So imagine that you have here point O here, and you have a curve C tilde that is like this. So that doesn't include the point O inside. So the number of times that this curve travels anti-clockwise, or in a positive sense around this point, is zero. So this integer number is zero. But if you take this point O, and this curve travels in the positive sense, encircling this point, 
it travels exactly once around the point in the positive sense. So this, this running number is plus one because it travels once in the anti-clockwise sense. So what happens if now we have this point O, but, this, but we invert this, the, the circulation sense of this curve? So we do something like this, again a curve, but now encircling in, in, in the opposite direction, in the negative sense or clockwise. So it is encircling the point O, but in the inverse direction. So this, this topological quantity will be minus one. As a final example of this, yes? Yeah. Thank you. Is it possible to have a different uh, winding number, so plus two, plus three? Plus yeah, that was what I was going to oh, do okay, next. Sorry. So <laughs> imagine that you, you now have a curve that do this. So it goes like this once, and then again twice. So you go around along these, these, the circulation of this curve, you go twice around the, the, the point O. So yes, now you have plus two. And you could do the same in the opposite direction. Yes? Just uh, a question on the right case, because I mean, I understand why is omega is equal to minus one, but you defined omega as the number of times you travel anticlockwise. In that case, is zero because it never travels anticlockwise. Well, I'm, it's, I, when we, you return to the initial point, you are worse than before. You, you have traveled backwards. In, it's, so it's backwards in this sense. Okay. So I hope it's clear that, for example, let's, let me erase this case here. Okay. So I think it might be clear that if I now take this curve, C tilde here, and I make a continuous deformation of this curve without intersecting this point O, so imagine something like this. Doesn't matter how much you deform it, as long as it doesn't intersect this point, this quantity is still the same. So it has some topological character associated with it. And it is also clear, I hope, that this quantity only changes if this curve kind of, when you modify, intersects or is about to intersect this point O. So if C, C uh, tilde lambda crosses this point O, then this quantity W can change. And because of the definition of our point O here, which is you have zero components of this vector, that means in the original space, this will be equivalent to, let me find some space now, this will be equivalent of saying that if the curve C lambda in the original spray, the space crosses a critical point, so a point where the, this field V is zero, which is, remember, from the definition of V, this is essentially the gradient of our function H, then this W can change as well. So, key point. You, if you have a critical point in, here inside of the, where the gradient of your function is zero, if you make a deformation of this curve without intersecting this point, we have a well-defined topological quantity that is, doesn't care about the deformation you, you make, as long as this curve doesn't intersect this critical point. So for those of you that like some more formal mathematics, there's another quantity that you can define. So there is a, um, you can define the Brouwer degree of continuous maps. Um, and essentially, this Brouwer degree will essentially have the same, uh, in this case, will lead to the same uh, quantity um, although it's a little bit more abstract and uh, less clarifying, yes? Yeah, yeah, sure. Just a curiosity. Uh, if I um, take the curve that you, def you define at the beginning, the black one, 
and I stretch it like I shrink it in an eight shape, yes. but without touching the O, the center, because I could, right? Yes. Does it change the topology? No. So that you, you, you are really anticipating what I'm going to do next. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so that is, uh, so thank you for <laughs> anticipating. <laughs> that is exactly what we are going to do. So imagine that you have several critical points here. You can make a deformation of the curve to isolate the curve around each one. So you can then associate not only a topological charge to the contour, but to each critical point individually. That will be exactly what we are going to do. So let me make this drawing simpler. Have something like this. And you have a critical point here, another here, another here, for example. If you now make a, a continuous deformation of this contour, for example, in this way, so you put, you take this part and you push it in this direction, this topological charge will not change. And I can play this game until I reach this point. So these asterisks, asterisks are a notation for a critical point here. So you are, you are circulating in the positive sense, so you have this. So this point was coming from before and you have pushed this until they start to touch again. Okay, at this point you, you, can, you can say for your original contour that you had this omega, which is one over two pi, C lambda, And now you can separate this into two components. You can have this upper part, let's call it a contour around this asterisk here, and a remaining part, also in the positive sense. Let's call it a contour C rest. I hope this, this drawing is clear what we, what we uh, try to do. So this was C lambda. Now this integral, you, we can separate into two components. It, I hope it, it is clear uh, that we can. Uh, so this will be one over two pi contour integration around C asterisk, the omega plus one over two pi C rest. So we can associate this part with the contour integration only around this point. And so to this part we can call it W asterisk. So the topological charge associated only with this critical point. And if you have, a, a, even if you have a large number of points, as long as it's not an uncountable set, you can always play this game and write your original um, integral simply as a sum. So if you have a manifold that has no holes, that is important. You can always make these deformations approach each critical point individually and write omega as a sum I, so this is a sum over all critical points inside C lambda. Okay, that is all nice. So this, this uh, omega was, or, that, or uh, it was this original expression. Okay, so this is all nice, but how can I obtain each one of these quantities individually? For that, we can take this contour, and again, we can make a continuous deformation of each one of these contours and approach this point as much as we want, without never intersecting it. So now, 
we can make some additional assumption that original function h from which we obtain the vector v, which is kind of a gradient, is C2. Second order continues. To make a, a definition of this quantity, you ne only need C1. But to, to connect uh, the, these quantities with the second derivatives of this function, you need it to be C2. Then you can make approxim an approx a local approximation that your field uh, V, close to the critical point, is given by this following form. So this is essentially the coordinates of your critical point. Where this matrix A is essentially the derivative of the vector field at the critical point. Now, there is a key assumption that we are going to need. We are going to say that the determinant of this matrix A, it can, take, can be equal to zero, or it can be different from zero. That will be important to compute this topological charge. If it is equal to zero, we need higher orders. And that, let's, call, let's, let's define this as a degener, de, uh, degenerate, degenerate, critical point. We are not going to consider this case here. That requires a more complicated analysis. Let's assume that this determinant is different from zero, so we can define this as a non-degenerate critical point. So it's a nice exercise that one can try to do. Let me erase this. It's a very nice exercise to show that this omega asterisk connected with a given critical point will simply be equal to the sign of the, the determinant of A. So you can see that if the determinant is zero, we have a problem. And because A is essentially connected with the second derivative of your potential, this will be equal to the sign of the determinant of the second of the uh, Hessian matrix constructed from your potential H. So in a way, this can you from this you can readily tell that if you have a local maximum or a minimum for that matter of your function H. The determinant will be positive, so the sign will be plus one. So omega asterisk will be plus one. For a maximum or a minimum, it doesn't matter if it's a maximum or a minimum of your potential. If it's a saddle point, then this quantity will be minus one. Because for a saddle point, the determinant of the SN matrix is minus one. So let's make a drawing to illustrate this a little bit better. Imagine now that instead of x and y, we have now r and theta. We go back to our original problem. This framework does not depend on the exact problem that we have, given that initial assumptions are satisfied. And our uh, gradient equal to being equal to 0 is essentially that the gradient of h plus minus is equal to 0. Imagine that we have these this uh, some function h that has these uh, contour lines, so lines with 
constant value that looks something like this. So this is r, this is theta, and these are lines with h plus minus equals to a constant. So this point, you have a maximum of, or a minimum of your potential, and here as well, and here you have a, a saddle point. From this, you can easily conclude that this point here locally should have a topological charge connected with it, which is minus one, here plus one, and here plus one as well. So, if you make a contour integration just around this point, you have, you have, this, will, this contour will have a charge of plus one. If you make a contour integration that surrounds, in the positive sense, that surrounds both this, this saddle point and this maximum, you will have a topological charge, which is the sum of those, which is zero. So this omega will be zero for this contour integration. And if you have a contour integration that includes all three, it is again the sum, will be plus one. So for the, for the case where you have this potential h plus minus equal to zero, this will act, actually correspond to the locations of the light ring in the r theta plane, if you remember the last lecture. So if you have a local maximum, if you have a saddle point of your, of your potential h, this will correspond to what you can call a standard line light ring. It is precisely, if you remember the case around um, around Schwarzschild or Kerr. You have a saddle point of your potential and it has a topological charge of minus one. So you can ask, can, can you have also a local maximum or minimum of your potential? And the answer is yes. You have uh, one, one, what you can call an exotic light ring. And there are two types. There will be two types for these exotic light rings. If it is, so the, uh, uh, to have a topological charge of plus one, it doesn't matter if it's a maximum or a minimum, but then to classify these exotic light rings, it does depend, it does matter. So if you have a minimum, not of H, but of the original potential R theta, that depends on the impact parameters, These will be stable light rings. And you can find this type of, uh, of light rings around boson stars, for example. In contrast, if you have a maximum, if you have a maximum of this potential U, you will have an unstable light ring, but with a plus one charge. It is also exotic, but it's kind of super exotic. So it's uh, super unstable, let's call it super unstable. Light ring. This one is exotic, but you can find models, concrete models, for example, in boson stars, where these light rings exist. To my knowledge, I, I'm not aware of any model where this type of light ring exists. It's unstable in all directions, but in principle, it could be possible. What's curious about this is that it violates the null energy condition. So probably that's one of the reasons why you cannot find it very in a lot of models. Okay, let's move on.
Now, with this technique, we can now start to apply it to concrete models. Let's start with horizonless space times in equilibrium with the assumptions that we discussed last time. So you have two killing vectors, delta t and delta phi, and also some coordinate system, t, r, theta, and phi. We are going to focus, so we have h plus and h minus, so that would give two rotation sensors for the light ring, but uh, let's only focus on h plus and also drop the, the plus for simplicity because you can get the same thing for h minus, so this will be the same at the boundary. If you take your field V and change the sign. So to simplify the notation, let's just focus on the positive sign and even forget that there are two. I can take the two-dimensional space orthogonal to the killing vectors and let's represent in a kind of cylindrical coordinates. Though this is kind of a, um, X coordinate, this is kind of a Z coordinate, which is R cosine of theta. This is just to help visualize this because these are the coordinates that we are going to focus. And so this is an horizonless space time. Let's make a contour that captures the necessary boundary conditions to conclude something about the existence or not of light rings uh, in this space time. You can take a section with uh, close to the origin with a constant radial coordinate. So R equals constant, and let's call this R naught. Then you can take a section with a constant theta that is deviated with the angle delta from the axis. So this is the axis, and also the same down, also an angle delta. And then we can close this contour with a, a section that has also a constant radial coordinate, capital R, which is a constant in, in, the, in this section. So now we can, for this contour C, lambda, we can define the topological charge as 2 pi omega C, which is the contour integration of this angle delta omega over C lambda. But this is only for this contour C lambda. If you want to capture all of space-time, you can take some limits. You can take this R0 going to zero, and it approaches the origin you can take this delta to zero, and these sections approach the axis, and you take and th can take this capital R and make it go to infinity. So you have these all boundary conditions that it are going to be easy to compute. So you can define this omega for your entire space time. So this will be the topological charge of essentially all space time, except the axis, but you don't have light rings at the axis, as the limit when this capital R goes to plus infinity, limit when R naught goes to zero, and also the limit when delta goes to zero. Of the topological charge that you would obtain from this contour C. Okay, so let's start with the first condition, the one that we'd obtain from the axis. So axis condition, the axis boundary. So you are approaching a rotation axis 
And that means that there is a set of points that have G phi phi equals to that the, the square of the azimuthal gilding vector is zero. And you have also that G T phi, so the uh, scalar product between the, 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 other, the two killing vectors, it's also zero. And then we can introduce a local coordinate. Rho, defined as simply the square root of G phi phi. So if you have a, an axis, this coordinate is kind of probing some direction orthogonal to the axis in a perpendicular way. And using this auxiliary coordinate close to the axis, we can make the following expansion of the metric components. So g t phi will be given by approximately b0, which is a constant. Uh, this auxiliary coordinate rho to the power of n, where this n is a natural number. And this GTT will be simply, will also approach um, a number, which is different than zero. You don't have a black hole in the axis, so it's just a number. Now, if you want regularity at the axis, so this is a key condition, you want regularity at the axis, this will imply that GT phi can, can only go to zero as fast or faster than, uh, than G phi phi. And in particular, this implies that this N has to be greater or equal than two, this N here. So there is a constraint from regularity to how fast this GT phi, GT phi must go to zero. So, if you take your function h, it will be essentially the square root in this limit of gtt0 over rho. And you also have that gtt, d to theta squared, it will be approximately g rho rho, d rho squared. So the component of v theta will be approximately sine of delta rho over d theta h rho rho. What matters here is that it will go as sine of d rho over d theta, one over rho squared. It, so it will blow up when you approach the axis. Now, depending on the sign of this, it can diverge to plus or minus infinity. It will go to one, as one minus one over rho squared when theta goes to zero, and one over rho squared when theta goes to pi. So V theta goes as one over rho squared, and V R as one over rho. So both will diverge at the axis, but one will diverge much faster than the other. So the component V theta squared will be much larger than VR when this rho goes to zero. Okay, so if, you, if I make this drawing VR, and V theta, I make a drawing of, of the field V and this angle omega. You can see from, from these relations that close to the axis,
So the V theta component will dominate, but it will go as minus to minus infinity when theta goes to zero. And so that implies that uh, this angle must go to minus pi over two. So minus pi over two when theta goes to zero. And it must go to pi plus pi over two when theta goes to pi. This is easier to visualize in a, in a diagram that I should draw a little bit better. So this is kind of the theta axis, and here at the top is pi. Here is zero, and this is the radial direction. So it's the same two-dimensional space that we have been talking about. What this means is that close to um, theta equals two pi, this vector will be pointing outwards like this. And for zero, so here, it will be pointing in the opposite direction. But the, an easier way to remember this is just to realize that the gradient of H will be simply pointing to the axis. This is essentially what this vector field is telling you, that the gradient is pointing to the axis. So, in this limit, this, this direction will be essentially the same, will not change. So, omega will be approximately constant along the axis, axis part of C lambda. So, when we take this limit, delta goes to zero, of delta omega, theta equals delta, theta equals pi minus delta, this will go to zero. The contribution from the axis to the topological charge goes to zero. Okay, so that was the axis boundary condition. What about infinity? Let's look at infinity. So at infinity, you assume that you have approximately flat space-time in spherical coordinates. So in that case, this function h plus will be at infinity going as one over r sine of theta. And so this implies that the radial component of the, your field V will go as m minus one over r squared sine of theta. And so this implies that the sine of Vr at infinity will be negative, minus one. For this, the only thing that matters is the sign. You might wonder, so what about the sign of V theta at infinity? Does it matter? It's not, it can change, but it doesn't really matter. It's not important. What matters only is that the component of VR at infinity is negative. So here in this diagram, we can draw arrows like this. When we approach the bottom part here of this diagram, it will begin to tilt to be continuous. The only thing that matters, doesn't matter how is the change in theta, the only thing that matters here at the boundary, close to infinity, let's put here infinity, is that the radial component is negative in this vector. So you can take the circulation in the positive sense. So if you make the compute the limit, when the capital R goes to infinity of the omega R equals to R, 
this will be essentially the integration over theta, this part of the contour, from zero to pi, when you circulate this contour in the positive sense of d omega over d theta at infinity, you can see how this angle changes when we go from here to here. You can see that the angle is rotating in the negative sense. And it has to go do a full minus pi turn when we go from this point to here. You can see what happens to the vector. So this contribution will be minus pi. The contribution to, from infinity to the topological charge will be a minus pi angle. We are almost done for this part. We have the origin contribution now, which is the critical boundary, which is critical what is important in the horizonless case. So close to the, ax uh, close to the origin, it's also close to the axis in a way, so you have that H will go as one over rho. And in particular, you have that G phi phi, which is the, that auxiliary coordinate rho, goes as R sine of theta. And then you have some generic dependency that doesn't matter much. And for the condition for the origin is that this radial coordinate goes to zero. So if you take this and compute the component of VR, it goes as minus one over r squared sine of theta, which implies that the sine of this component vr at the origin will be minus one, again. And what's the sine of v theta at the origin? It can change, doesn't matter. What matters, as in infinity, is that is the sine of the radial component, so let's Include it here. So, if you make a contour integration in this part of, close, of the contour close to the origin, so with r equals to r naught, here is will be r naught, and take the limit when this quantity r naught goes to zero. This will be essentially the contour integration, the, the, the integration of d omega d theta, d theta. But now with, with uh, from the angle pi to zero, because you are circulating in this sense, so you would go from pi to zero. This will be pi. Why? Because you are circulating in this sense, and you can see that the vector is circulating now in the pi in the positive sense. So this is the contribution from the origin. Oh, sorry about that. So, we now can combine everything. So the conclusion for horizonless space times, so the horizonless case, you have two pi omega for infinity here, they have a part from infinity, you have a part from the origin, so integration with R. It, um, and you also have an, a contribution from the axis. This part here, the contribution from infinity, the contribution is minus pi. The contribution from the origin is pi. And the contribution from the axis, since omega is essentially constant, this contribution is zero. So you can see that this will imply that omega is zero. For any horizonless space time.
with the conditions that were assumed. So there are two possibilities here. Either there are no light rings, or there are light rings non-generate non in pairs. In, and if they appear, they must appear in combinations of plus one and minus one charges. So it will be typically a standard light ring with kind of an exotic stable light ring if you don't violate the null energy condition. This is essentially what this result is telling you. Okay, that was for an horizonless space-time. What about a black hole case? I'm going to cheat a little bit because a lot of the things will be the same. The boundary conditions will be essentially the same, except for the origin. We have now to include the condition for an horizon. And that will change this, this, the sign of VR to the opposite sense, and that, that condition alone will change everything. So, let me erase this as well. So, we have a black hole case. So we have an equilibrium space-time, as before. And then you assume that you have a killing horizon that exists at R equals RH. You assume some condition of regularity close to the horizon. In particular, you want the Ricci scalar to be finite near the horizon. You assume that the horizon has an S2 topology, the horizon. So it's topologically simple. And you assume that your black hole is not extremal. So you have a surface gravity, K, which is positive and different from zero. This condition of regularity allows us to introduce a coordinate, a local coordinate, local coordinate, x close to the horizon. such that this coordinate x is zero at the horizon, that g x x dx is equal to g r r dr, and also that g x x is equal to one. And with this local choice of the coordinate that you can make under these conditions, it's not vacuum necessarily, then your potential h will be given by omega h, so the angular velocity of the horizon, plus k x divided by the square root of g phi phi computed at the horizon. So this k is a surface gravity. So you can see right away that you have a problem for an extremal black hole. If you now take this and you compute the component vr, it goes as k over square root of g phi phi over h. So the sign of vr at the horizon is plus one. So you have to invert this. So when you take the limit now for the contribution from the horizon, you take this R, R naught to the horizon of the omega R equals RH, with this will be an integration at the horizon d theta, and from theta from pi to zero, and positive sense you go from pi to zero, this will be, give a contribution of minus pi. Before it was pi, now it's minus pi. And so, 
if you compute the total topological charge, this will give the omega infinity, which is again minus pi. And the contribution from the horizon This will give a contribution also of minus pi, and the contribution from the axis, which is zero. So you sum this, it gives minus two pi. And so you conclude that the topological charge of the light rings around the black hole is minus one instead of zero. So what are the conclusions? You must have either at least one light ring for each sign of your potentials. Because remember, we did this only for one of the potentials. I, it could be H plus. The calculations will be essentially the same for the other potential. What happens is that the direction of these vectors changes sign at the boundary. That's the only thing that changes. So that will lead exactly to, to the same conclusion. So one of two things must happen. Either you have at one light ring, at least, for each sign of H plus minus, or you can have extra black holes, no, extra light rings, I'm sorry. You can have extra light rings, non-degenerate, in combinations of plus one, minus one charges. So again, they must appear in pairs. So I think I'm almost uh, out of time. How much time do I have, more or less? Three minutes, okay. I, I'm also really uh, arriving to the end. Let me just include some, a couple of references for people that would like to know more. Some, so some references you have to, for archive, which, because it's easier to write, F2003, 06, 45. This is about the topological charge of black holes. Work with, uh, Professor Carlos Herdeiro also. Then you have 1708-04211. This will be, is a paper about the topological charge around horizonless space times. It's a paper that I, uh, done in collaboration with Professor Carlos Herdeiro and Professor Emmanuel Eberti. And also you have some other papers, 2208 this is a, a fairly recent paper about applying these topological techniques to thermodynamic um, defects around black holes. So black holes, uh, thermodynamics defects. So it's an application of these sort of techniques in a very different context. And uh, since I think it was Caio that asked me yesterday, we have also this paper that the attempt to use these topological, topological techniques uh, for topological charge, but for time-like orbits. So let me close also with a couple of comments about possible work. So this is also for the students out there that would like to take on this and do some uh, generalization of some of these results, let me point out that, for example, a key, a key assumption here in all of this discussion is circularity. So gen generalizations without circularity, that would be extremely interesting if you have any ideas. I'm very happy to discuss. Another generalization could be higher dimensions, five, di five dimensions, but with few killing vector fields. There, are, there has been some papers in the literature generalizing these concepts in five dimensions, but with more killing vector fields. So it doesn't change the difficulty that much. So with very few killing vector fields, I guess instead of a contour, you have a surface integration in that case. Um, but I'm guessing, I don't know the details. Um, you can take, for example, four dimensional black holes, but with non-trivial topologies. Here we assume that the horizon has a simple topology in a way, it's an S2 sphere topologically speaking, and perhaps even generalizing in four dimensions with a few symmetries, even uh, with no axial symmetry and so on. So there's all these things that can still be done. 
Um, and if you have any ideas, I'm very happy to discuss. And with this, I'm going to close. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. Do we have any questions online? No? Okay. Do we have questions from the audience? Uh, hi, Pedro. So, first of all, happy birthday. It's his birthday today, okay? <laughs> So I promise that uh, I, I promised him I wouldn't ask any difficult questions, so I won't. <laughs> Even because I, I've been discussing these things with Peter for a long time. No, I just wanted to, to make a little comment, which is uh, these ideas that were originally proposed by Pedro, they took a life of their own. And um, I think it's an example of how, you know, using some you know, not extremely difficult mathematics, but having some intuition, you can uh, make a contribution that expands to different things. So now people are using this for thermodynamics. And whenever you have some critical points of some sort of potential, I mean, there's a, a potential to apply these sort of ideas. So it's, it's very powerful. And you can actually make a lot of interesting uh, conclusions and powerful ones. So, so it's that. So it's a compliment rather than a question. So that's it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any more questions or comments? Uh, hi, Pedro. <laughs> so uh, my question is about the axis limit. So uh, this uh, analysis is valid for uh, geometries where you have conical singularities, because the, uh, this type of singularities, they are uh, not very apparent uh, at the first sight. <laughs> yeah, that, thank you, Errol. That's a very good question. If they are valid, if you have a conical singularity. So the critical assumption that is being made is that as you approach the axis, the richest scalar is finite. Although exactly at the axis it is not, but uh, um, I think this approach could still be valid, although I would be extra careful. Uh, uh, as, a as, as far as I remember, these conical singularities, they, uh, well, they, they reach the scalar and the curvature scalar can be fine, although you have some problems there which exactly. are more uh, subtle to, to, yeah. to detect. Uh, uh, I think uh, in this case... Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you can have an extra a a a deficit angle or an extra angle. I'm, I'm just wondering if this could introduce some subtleties, but, uh, yes, uh, so but I'm not sure. I think this is general enough to probably even include that case, although I want to be cautious about saying that, but uh, I don't see any problems directly. The assumption is very conservative that as you approach the axis without intersecting it, the Ricci scalar does not explode. And that is only necessary to enforce a certain decay rate for the GT5 component uh, okay. we, with respect to the, this raw coordinate, which okay. is kind of this uh, proper, well, uh, yeah, you, you understand. Okay, okay. thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah. You see, uh, the thing is about the, the, um, the conical singularity is an idealization. So, of course, what you'd expect is that it's smoothed out by some smooth matter distribution. And in that sense, you know, this argument would apply. Of course, it's easier to deal with something that is concentrated, the curvature at the point, right? But at the end of the day, if such a, a similar object would exist in nature, you'd expect it to be smoothed out, right? And then it would apply. But of course, you can deal with that mathematical question as well. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. So, do we have any more questions? A quick one? A quick one? Yeah. Thank you, Pedro, again. So now I'm very curious about the time-like case because, so if you think about black hole, the light ring there is unstable, right? You can put a circular geodesics there if you, I mean, if you have enough energy, but that orbit is unstable. 
right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have stable, highly energetic orbits in the, in the black hole case for time-like, time-like case. So uh, is, is there a way to show whether uh, you could have stable, uh, highly energetic orbits in other situations? For instance, uh, you, if you try to investigate, um, I don't know, uh, these transitions uh, for the stable light ring in the same sense, Maybe this could show you that you could have stable time-like geodesics inside that have a high energy and high angular momentum and therefore could emit a lot of uh, waves because in the end, so that's, that's uh, what... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I fully understood your question. So you're f talking about uh, light rings, or, so the null geodesic case or the time-like? I'm not sure if I... It's actually both because, both. yeah, because you can think as uh, a light ring, also uh, from the time-like geodesic perspective, you can as a force, yeah, as, as, as a kind of... So, limit. what I can say is that there has been, I don't have a good answer for you, uh, with using this framework, so there has been some attempts to use these topological charge techniques for time-like uh, geodesics, there are some attempts. Uh, my personal, um, in my personal view, I think there can be a limitation uh, on the current application that I read because you, depending on the, you have to uh, uh, have a control parameter. It's not just a single potential, you have like a control parameter. And depending on the choice of the control parameter, the topological charge of the entire space-time can be different. So it's not just a single number. So I personally, I find that a little bit um, incomplete in a way. I think there is more to this picture. But uh, I think that this technique can have some potential to clarify some questions with great generality. But at the moment, I cannot say much more. Thank you. So thank you. So let's thank the speaker again.